Hi and welcome to C3 Yorks Online. Here's what's coming up today in our series, The Gospel in a Nutshell. And finally, it's meant that in the hard times, in sadness, in grief, in mental health struggles, in the stuff that is really hard to express, I know that he knows. This is what the gospel active in my life looks like in the midst of anxiety, depression, and when fear and death haunt me. That God loves me, he comforts me, and he brings light and hope to me. And the same for you too today. Good morning. So we're continuing our series, Gospel in a Nutshell today. And I'm here, Lucy, to tell you about my story of how I came to faith. So it begins right at the very beginning when my mum found out she was pregnant with me. Because at a similar time to her finding out this news, she also got some devastating news. Her mum, my nanan, was uh, diagnosed with incurable bowel cancer. My nanan was told that she wouldn't live long enough to meet me and see me be born. However, I have heard so much about my Nanan's resilience, her faith, her joy, and her Yorkshire ways being a key part to who she was. And she would constantly sing the, the hymn, Because He Lives. And throughout her journey of, of battling and, and coping with cancer, she actually did survive to meet me. And whenever we're together as a family, the song, the hymn, Because He Lives, is like a, an anthem for us. It's a song which has beautiful word, words, and it talks about, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. So, despite what the doctors had said, she did get to meet me and hold me. And on the 29th of November, 1990, I was born, Lucy Joy, and my middle name being Joy in remembrance of her. And from that hymn, Because He Lives, she would sing over me a particular verse which says, How sweet to hold a new baby and feel the pride and joy she gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. This is what's been in my past and this is what's part of my family and this is part of my heritage. This, this resilient faith that my Nanan had, even in such a traumatic time. Then when I was eight weeks old, I developed bronchiolitis which is an inflammation of the um, small airways in the lungs. And when you're that young, it can be really dangerous. A lot, of, a lot of kids develop it and get over it. But for me, I did actually become seriously ill. And I was in and out of hospital fighting for my life. And my parents were really scared that I wouldn't survive. But even in the trauma of this illness and in the trauma of what was going on with you know, my nan at the time, the lyrics of the song, Because He Lives, and the prayers of my family and the church give great comfort amongst fears, a time of fear. And thankfully, you know, I turned a corner and I made a full recovery. I had almost a year with my Nanan and it was when I was about 11 months old, she, she lost her fight. Um, she had always been and will always be a huge part of our family. The pain of her illness and the grief of her death is felt simultaneously with the joy of her life and the hope of Jesus that she always professed. The scripture that comes to mind from Nehemiah 8 verse 10 is, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it is in these times of, of great trauma and grief and, and despair that we can really understand that joy is so much more than just a feeling. You know, it's different from feeling happiness. Joy is a deep thing and it comes from God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Then when I was around 18 months old, my health deteriorated once more. And I began to have these fits and nobody knew why. Um, I just kept having them. It was really unclear. And it was during one of these fits. I think my dad had got me out of the bath and he was getting me ready for bed. And I started having a fit. And um, I actually went into respiratory arrest, which is when you, you stop breathing. 
So we called for my mum, who thankfully is a nurse, a great nurse, and uh, she came in and she started to resuscitate me whilst waiting for an ambulance to arrive. I was stabilised and blue lighted to the hospital. And whilst having my x-ray, it happened again. So again, I was resuscitated. And um, I think knowing just how close to death I've been, especially on those occasions, it really makes me grateful and thankful that I have breath in my lungs today. And it reminds me how precious life is and that there's purpose to my life. And you know, that's for you too. You have breath in your lungs. If you're watching this today, your life matters. Your life has purpose. You know, there's, there's so much more to your life than you might even realize right now. And you know, it's just something to be so grateful for that you are alive today. So from that age until about four, I was kind of constantly poorly. I was always on some sort of antibiotic. Um, there's lots of home videos of me coughing and just not kind of the best of health, um, used inhalers and all that kind of thing. But eventually around the age of four, I actually had my tonsils removed. And it was after that that the fits and all these illnesses sort of subsided and normalised. And I can really remember these memories as some of my earliest memories, I would say. And that time being in hospital, I remember the ward, I remember what it looked like. I remember the friends on the ward, like the little boy in the, in the um, bed next to me, colouring in, the food I ate, <laughs> so random. Um, and I just remember how you know, it's just a really strong memory of, of being in hospital and I, I suppose it's because it's it's a quite a scary thing to be in hospital as a child and seeing different things and meeting different people and having them prod and poke you and you know needles and injections and different things like this but at the same time I actually felt quite confident I was surrounded by you know family I was surrounded by prayers and um, by the grace of God you know, everything, everything was good and I'm alive today. But the other thing that I can really remember, which happened when I was four, was asking Jesus into my heart. So this is when I actually became a Christian for myself. So you probably gathered, I've been born into a family of, of believers, born again Christians, and I've been brought up this way. I've been brought up listening to the Bible, hearing the word of God. I've been brought up in church. I've been brought up praying before bedtime, all these kind of things. But it doesn't automatically make me a Christian. I've had to choose it for myself. And so on a particular Thursday evening at the church I was going to, which was Whitley Bay Baptist Church from the Northeast. <laughs> and um, on a particular Thursday evening at this church, they had a event or, a, you know, evening club called the Good News Club. And it was for children aged four to seven. And during this club, there was a, a teacher called Kathy Barry, and she made a huge impact on my life. On a Sunday morning, she was the person you'd often see at the side of the front, and she'd be sign language in the whole service so that it would be, you know, everybody could hear the message. And as a kid, I would stand there and watch her and be fascinated. I'd try and copy along and do a bit of the sign language. And to see her there each week, she was someone who was really happy and smiley, really engaging. She had just really open body language. And as a child, I recognized her as a very safe person, as someone who was full of joy, laughter, but knew God, but also someone that as a child I could trust. So she was running this good news club every Thursday. And on this particular one, she was um, telling the story of Jesus' death and resurrection but it wasn't just a normal story. It was actually through a puppet show. So I can vividly remember this puppet show. It was sort of out of felt puppets and you know, away it went. And at the end, she basically talked about how we can have eternal life through acknowledging Jesus as our Lord and Savior and asking him into our hearts. And that's something that we all get to do and we all can choose if we want to. And then at the end of the whole session, she did what most kids workers do. And they say, has anyone got any prayer requests? And I think she expected different people to put their hands up and say, you know, can you please pray for, you know, whatever it is at school or mum's bad shoulder or the usual kind of things that we get at these events. And um, I put my hand up 
And she said, yeah. And I remember at that point, instead of telling him a prayer request, I just spoke out my prayer. And I spoke out in front of this room of, of four to seven year olds, Jesus, I want you in my heart. And I specifically remember that still today, that that was my you know, first moment of revelation of, I want Jesus in my life. And so, you know, I might have been young and it might have been through a puppet show that I first really engaged and understood the gospel. But I did know at that moment that Jesus had taken his place on that cross for me. I knew that he loved me and I knew that I needed him. And it's probably also one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about children's ministry today and our kids growing up hearing the good news of Jesus, the gospel. Proverbs 22 verse six, six says, direct your children onto the right path and when they are older, they will not leave it. So after that decision, I grew up a happy and healthy child. Lots of fun times were had and it was probably when I got to my teenage years in high school, that I probably gave my parents a little bit more grief and worry. I don't know, they might tell me a different story. Um, I lived quite a busy life. I had lots of friends. I actually loved my school experience. Um, I went to lots of parties, went to lots of gigs. I was into heavy metal at the time. I went to festivals and um, I wore a lot of black. I remember my mum saying, is this phase ever going to end? And I remember turning to her saying, this is not a phase. Anyway, uh, she, we still talk about that every now and then. But my mum and dad allowed me a lot of freedom to be me. And I think that's something that really strikes me now as a parent. I know, I think, oh, what's it going to be like when my kids are teenagers? What, I'm not going to let them out of my sight. But actually thinking about that level of trust and actually trusting, trusting God as well. You know, God had me probably more than my parents ever had me and um, just just trusting them. So amongst my busy social life and my alternative music, hanging out with friends, family time and going to church was always and is always a top priority in our household. So no matter to what the music I listen to, no matter who you know, my friends were, no matter the difference of opinion of my peers, I actually knew the way to go deep down. I knew what God wanted. I knew God needed me. I knew that I needed God. I knew that he loved me. And I knew no matter what, that I was loved and I was wanted from God. And I knew this by my parents too. So even though Probably in my teen years, I found church quite boring. <laughs> Some of the stuff would go over my head. I didn't always get on with all the other teenagers there. We were kind of maybe into different things. I did always know that I needed God. And I knew that the family of church mattered. And in the area, there was a local youth worker called Rob. And he would work at one of, one of the other churches mainly, but he would kind of go between all the churches and he would come into schools and do sort of like youth school ministry. Um, and he would do different events and nights and invite different youth groups to them and all the youth, you know, he'd fly in the schools and that kind of thing. Um, so this Rob is another person who sticks out in my memory of, of sort of growing up because he was someone who... He was a bit cheesy sometimes, if I'm honest, like as a teenager, I didn't always kind of get him. And, but he was totally unashamed of the gospel. He was totally unashamed and he was so passionate about youth and teenagers and, and sharing his faith with them. And it was something that I really respected actually. He was carefree and he did everything with such excitement. His heart for God and young people was so evident. And there was one particular time where he started a night called Dimensions and he'd invited, you know, different youth along to it. And me and a couple of the others from my youth group said, right, yeah, we'll go along. And it was on one of these nights where we were all just hanging out, having fun. And then he went and did a bit of a talk and he said to us all, I want you to think right now of, as your life as a timeline. And he asked us to take a bit of paper and draw out this timeline. And on one side, write all the high points, all the big things that we think of. And on the other side, even the, the, the darker things, the things that were, 
you know, the loss or the grief or the times when people passed away or all those things, those significant moments. And in the end, this timeline was filled with all sorts of things. And he basically then just said, over all of this, God is for you, he's with you, he wants you, he sees you, he knows you, he loves you. And he just kind of put this perspective on my life where, you know, all these things could happen, but God's always there and he's always with me and he's bigger than it all as well. And it just gave me this, another revelation of God. And I think it's another big moment in my life growing up where it just sort of clicked a bit more of who God is. And it was after that night that I actually went home and I realized I needed to make the next step in my faith. And that was to be baptized. So I was around the age of 18 at this point. I got baptized and then I decided I would go on a mission trip to Mexico. And it was whilst in Mexico that again, another sort of revelation moment of who God is really hit me. Because I went to Mexico as a probably entitled teenager, <laughs> probably slight attitude problem, probably thinking I knew everything and had everything under control. But whilst out in Mexico, doing the work of God and meeting people, meeting people who had nothing but loved God, meeting people who didn't know God, meeting children who lived on the street, uh, you know, working in soup kitchens, meeting people who were there as missionaries, just doing God's work, just blessing people wherever they could. It just really struck me, the love of God, that actually, you know, I think for the very first time, my heart was properly broken. I thought I'd had breakups before and I thought I'd had heartache before and I thought I knew what that was. But whilst on that trip, my heart completely broke. I'd witnessed such desperation and during that time, I just felt so humbled by God. His love for me, the love for his people, it reaches far and wide. Even in desperate situations, even in the darkest of places, Nothing and no one is too far from God. You are not too far from God. Even though we stray and even though we might turn away from him, even though we might do wrong things and even though life might be really hard, even though we deny him, he wants us and he loves us. Ephesians 3 verse 18 says, and, you, uh, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. And it's because of this love that we read about here that we have the gospel, the good news. <laughs> so what is the gospel? What do we mean when we say the good news? So for me, I'll always kind of picture it as that first time I heard it properly in a way that I understood when I was four. I'll always picture that, that puppet show. <laughs> um, but it kind of sum, it summed up in, in John 3, 16 and 17. It says this, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son, that's Jesus, into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So the gospel starts for us, by us recognizing that we need to be saved. And it's a tough one because sometimes we then go, well, what do I need to be saved from? Like life's good, I'm a good person, everything's fine. We need to be saved from all of the rubbish, <laughs> the sin, the shame, the anger, the hurt, the wrongdoing, the bitterness, the struggles, the pain, the depression, the anxiety. You might think these things are all normal, but this was never God's plan for his people. These aren't normal things. These aren't what God wanted for us. And ultimately we need to be saved from hell. We need to recognize then what Jesus did for us, that he died on the cross once and for all. And it's for all that stuff that I've listed, all the stuff. And it's for the sake of you and for me. But why would he do it? <laughs> Well, I've said it already. It's because of his love for us. He wants relationship with us. He wants relationship with you. And it's by us opening up our hearts to that love 
recognising what he's done for us and confessing him as our Lord and Saviour, that we not only get into a relationship with him today, but we enter into eternity in heaven too. And it's hard, isn't it? Because I think sometimes we try and figure it all out up here. We try and think like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't always, you know, we've got lots of questions and we can remain there for a long time. But there comes a time when it is a heart decision. We just have to open our hearts up to receive his love and accept what he's done for us. And just, just say, yeah, I need you, God. I need you, Jesus. And just, it's a heart decision. But you know, your story doesn't then stop when you make that decision. My story today, although I'm telling you mainly about, you know, making a decision to follow Jesus, my story didn't stop there. When I became a Christian at four, or when I got baptized at 18, or when I went on that mission trip, my story continues daily. The work of God and Jesus in my life is continuing on today. God is doing amazing things in my life. Because Following Jesus is more than just that initial decision and it's more than just getting baptised or it's more, it, it's a daily thing to be his disciple and to follow him. See, the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, is something that is active every single day in my life because I continue to follow him. So through it all, I've known God. I've known he's been there, ever faithful, ever present, loving and accepting me. But it's meant that in the good times, I can thank him, glorify him and feel blessed by him. And that is what the gospel active in my life looks like for me to live the life God has for me, just receiving his blessings as a child of God. But it's also meant that in the mundane, you know, those days that you just you just sort of on autopilot, the day to day routines, there's purpose to those days. This is the gospel active in my life. It's realizing that in those you know, mundane days, as a life dedicated to being his disciple, there's more to it. I'm there to be like Jesus in those mundane things, on the school run. It's about me loving people, seeing people, glorifying him just through my day, you know, my comings and goings day to day. And finally, it's meant that in the hard times, in sadness, in grief, in mental health struggles, in the stuff that is really hard to express, I know that he knows. This is what the gospel active in my life looks like in the midst of anxiety, depression, and when fear and death haunt me, that God loves me, he comforts me, and he brings light and hope to me. And the same for you too today. The gospel active in your life means so much more than just acknowledging a decision today. It's going out and being a disciple and living for him, having purpose. So to round up today, I told you a bit about my childhood. I told you a bit about how I became a Christian. Um, I've summed up the gospel in a nutshell through John 3, 16 and 17. And I've told you that still today, I choose to follow Jesus and believe the gospel, the good news. But here are some take home points for you. So the first one is that people matter. You matter. You know, I've told you various parts of my story and there's been people involved. Right early on, there was my family. There was my nana. And there was this resilient faith that is just, I've been brought up, surrounded by. My mum and dad loving and accepting me always. There's Kathy Barry, who was that children's worker who was just a safe and fun person. There was Rob, the youth worker, who was just purposeful and passionate and just, you know, unashamed of the gospel. And then there's people now in my life, my pastors, Chris and Gosha. Gosha is always there ready to pray on my behalf. There's the team around us. There's the friends in my church. There's so many people who I could call out today and say, these are important people in my life. And I'm so grateful and thankful for them. And there's people in your life too. But also, it's realising that you can be a person like that to someone too. You can be a significant person who's safe or who pray, you know, prays, who, who encourages, who is unashamed of the gospel. You can be an, make an impact on someone and be part of their story. 
And you know, alongside all of this, I was really thinking about the power of the church because throughout my story, the church has been there, <laughs> consistent. And I know church isn't always a perfect place. And I know church isn't always easy for us to get to or be part of. But when I was preparing this message, I was thinking about the dinner table with my family and how important a meal time would be where we'd sit round together, we'd catch up on our days, we'd have a meal together and we'd just embrace each other. And sometimes as a teenager, I might be sat around that table with not a lot to say, or sometimes, you know, we're being a bit moody, me and my sister. <laughs> and other times there's laughter and joy at the table. But there's something significant that's happening at that table. We're in relationship with one another. We're building a family together. There's something there that you just know you belong. You know that you're accepted. You know it's safe. All these things that come from being around that dinner table. And I was thinking about it just like, like church. Church is that sort of dinner table thing where we come together and we we spend time in each other's presence, in the presence of God as well. We're all from different walks of life, different circumstances and experiences. However, we're united in the church. And Sunday mornings, I suppose, are a bit like that family meal where you might not always feel like it. You might feel a bit distracted or a bit quiet. You might come to it feeling really hungry or you might come to it feeling I'm not really here for this today. You might not have a lot to say, you might have loads to say. But no matter what, it's important that you keep coming. It's important that we take time, this time together that we have, the church, it's such a precious thing and it has such value. And we need to hold it as value. Part of our households, we need to hold this as a valuable thing. You might not know everybody's name or you might not be sure who your friends are and you might not feel like it, but it's important that we turn up for church and that we belong to a church because we're not just here for ourselves, we're here for each other. And in gathering together, lives are changed. And secondly, your story matters. It's so easy to sort of say like, oh, my testimony is like not that incredible because I just grew up in church and you know, and I've said that before. I've been blown away by these stories of people having these like, you know, crazy lives and meeting God in a moment and everything changes. But equally, the power of God in my life is so important. It doesn't really quite matter how or why or where. It, ju it just matters that you did meet God. And so no matter what you've experienced, there is power in your story. Everyone's story is unique and powerful. It's personal and it has an impact. No one can take your story away from you. It tells and proclaims the good news of Jesus that you were once lost, but you are now found. And it's only by God's grace that any of us get to share it at all. And finally, number three is Jesus loves you. The love of Jesus is like nothing else. It's that totally unconditional love. It's not like you're going to find it anyway. You're not going to find it in a spouse or a friend. You're not going to find it in family because it, nobody can love you the way Jesus loves you. It's totally uncorrupted, perfect love. He won't fail in loving you. It's the kind of love that casts out fear. It's the kind of love that's safe and secure. Nothing can separate you from it. It's a love that's like a shield to keep you safe. And in saying all this about his love, he wants you to know that he loves you because he wants relationship with you. He wants to minister with you. He wants to heal you. He wants to walk with you. He just wants you. So I just pray that today, as you hear my words, that you would know that you are loved by Father God and by a saviour Jesus, and that your life matters. Let's just close in prayer. Father God, I just, I just thank you of who you are, that you're a powerful God, and that you're at work in all of our lives, whether we realise it today or not, that your power, your, who you are, that you are a powerful God. And just like I had that um, timeline moment where I just saw God in everything, I, I pray that people would have a relationship of a, a revelation today 
that your hand is on their lives, Lord God. Father God, I pray for our stories. I pray that you give us confidence and a boldness to share our stories, to share our experiences and to glorify you through what you have done in our lives. And finally, God, I pray that you would help us to see people, to be who you call us to be in your church and in our communities and in our workplaces and in the world that, you know, wherever we find ourselves. I pray that we would be who you've called us to be with purpose and just glorifying you through all things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, I hope you've enjoyed the message today. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear stories, experiences. So please do post something in the comments or just drop us a message at c3yorks.church forward slash connect. You can also use that link to ask for prayer or share uh, your stories as well. And don't forget to like, comment and share this message online if you found it helpful today. Uh, and if, if you haven't already done so as well, do subscribe. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, we'd love you to bring a tithe or, or give an offering towards the work that we can that we do here online. Uh, you can do that through our website. Details for that are on the screen right now. And if you're looking for a church, if you're in the Yorkshire area, you can come and say hi to us at one of our live in-person gatherings. We meet in Leeds and York every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. And all the details of when and where and any changes that might happen will always be on the homepage of our website at c3yorks.church. Well, we're back next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. with more from our The Gospel in a Nutshell series. Till then, have a great week. God bless.